This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. A family in Utah claims they were abducted from the safety of their home and held prisoner on board a UFO. Other people have also reported being captured by extraterrestrials. A man in Wyoming claims that while he was hunting, he came face to face with alien beings and was forcibly taken on board their spacecraft. Five hundred billion stars in our galaxy alone, each a seething universe spitting fire and light. Only recently have the powerful eyes of radio telescopes given mankind a glimpse of the infinity of space. Astronomers maintain that if intelligent life exists on distant worlds, the likelihood of it crossing the endless chasm of time and space is next to impossible. Yet, 50,000 UFO sightings are reported each year. Some are backed by what is purported to be concrete evidence, like the suspended image of a UFO captured by an Arizona cameraman in 1966. The television cameraman isn't the only person who's convinced that he has proof that UFOs are visiting the Earth. What's even more startling are the first-hand accounts of people who insist that they've been abducted by extraterrestrials. These people claim to have been held as prisoners on board spacecraft, examined by aliens, and then released. What makes their testimony difficult to dismiss is that it comes from average Americans. Carl Higdon is the foreman of an oil rig in Rawlins, Wyoming. He's been at the same job for 15 years, working six days a week to support a family of seven. His crew refers to him as the Wyoming Coyote because of his feisty determination to get the job done against all odds. An experienced woodsman with a love for the hunt, he looks forward to those days he can retreat into the forest. However, one October morning in 1974 was to be different from all other days. Carl recreates the events as he remembers them. I went to pick up my crew to go to work, and one of them was sick, so we couldn't work. So I came back to the house and decided I'd go hunting. So I decided to go on down into the forest, and I hunted down there until Oh, it must have been around 4 o'clock. So I walked down over this hill. Whenever I got over the hill, I seen these five elk standing down there. One of them was a big bull, so I raised my gun to shoot. Then, something happened beyond his range of experience. blacked out. When he regained consciousness, he was aware that an undetermined period of time had elapsed and that he had lost touch with reality. He stumbled through the forest in a dazed condition, trying desperately to figure out where he was and how he could get help. By eight in the evening, Marjorie Higdon became alarmed when her husband hadn't returned. She called for a search party. Hello, Marilyn? Yes, this is Margie. Um, Carl's not in from hunting yet, and I was wondering if you guys could take me out and look for him. Yeah, I know, but he's not in yet. Yeah, but I don't have a four-wheel drive. 
Uh huh. Well, I don't know. I just feel like I ought to go look for him. Carl's friends discovered him in a semi-conscious state. They were disturbed by his incoherent ramblings. What happened? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. It seems strange. You sure you're all right? Uh, yeah. You're not hurting anywhere? No. Okay. Get you out of here and get you to the doctor as soon as you can. Carl was rushed to the emergency ward of the Carbon County Hospital, where he had trouble seeing, hearing, and speaking. Nurse Ella Peterson attended him for three days. During that time, he remained mainly in an amnesiac state, unable to recall his own name or recognize his wife. After the incident, life in Rawlins changed for Carl. He was too disoriented to work or function normally. In desperation, he contacted the UFO agency, APRO, who sent Dr. Leo Sprinkle to investigate. Uh, I serve as a consultant in psychology, and my primary interest is working with those people who uh, claim to not only see uh, flying saucers, but also claim to have had some kind of abduction experience or some kind of contact, face-to-face uh, -face contact with uh, alien beings who are associated with the, uh, with the UFOs. I myself have investigated uh, uh, 23 persons <coughs> using hypnotic techniques to uh, assist them to recall uh, the experience. Okay, let yourself relax deeply and go right back to that same deep concentration, that same deep relaxation. Let the muscles relax. Let yourself know that you can breathe deeply and easily as you look at the spot. Sometimes these people have a loss of time experience, an amnesic uh, period which occurs during the UFO sighting, and then later they check their watches and find out that they have lost some time, which they cannot account for. And uh, these cases are most exciting and interesting because it suggests the possibility that uh, the persons have been taken on board, have been examined, and then released, and have been told that they will not remember what has happened. Bullet don't don't look right. There's somebody strange. Hmm. He wants me to go with him. Lights are bright. open can't see uh, they look like me same features he said the sun burns him he's gonna take me take me back Let yourself go back inside the cubicle. What happens inside the cubicle? Oh. I can't get in. There ain't no door. Do you know how you get in? No. We're above the trees. I can see pretty good. The ball looks like a 
basketball. But he's got a blue, gray outline. It's kind of dark. No lights. There, there's the lights again. Uh. We're back. In the investigation of a case, Dr. Sprinkle attempts to establish an abductee's credibility. He closely questioned Nurse Peterson to determine Carl's condition immediately following the incident. He uh, kept his eyes closed most of the time, saying that they hurt quite a bit. And uh, other than that, why, he had no complaints of pain. Raise both arms for me. This first detachment goes across your upper abdomen. In order to corroborate the story, he arranged for a polygraph exam to be administered. Regarding whether or not you actually had that UFO experience in question, do you intend to answer truthfully each question to that? Yes. Did you ride in that spacecraft you described to me? Yes. In my own personal opinion, uh, I find uh, with the cases I've investigated that uh, there seems to be no evidence of uh, hoax. Uh, there seems to be no evidence uh, of a psychotic reaction which has caused the individual to uh, falsely believe that he or she has had an abduction so that uh, I'm left with the uh, mysterious and sometimes uncomfortable feeling that the uh, cases are happening uh, as the individuals describe. That is, that they are being taken on board, examined, and released by intelligent beings uh, who, for their own reasons, uh, are engaging in these experiences. Carl managed to work through a traumatic incident that he had been unable to live with. With the help of Dr. Sprinkle, he no longer was haunted by nightmares. He no longer doubted his own sanity. The abduction experience was resolved to his own satisfaction, and Carl resumed his work with a new vigor. Don't make a hill of beans to me whether anybody believes it or not. Uh, I know what happened to me. If people want to take it at face value, that's fine. If they don't, it don't make any difference. The only thing I'm saying is if this does happen to anybody else, what they are to do is talk to somebody about it, not to hold it inside and try to conquer it themselves because it can't be done, I don't think. I don't think our mind can take it. Uh, as far as the uh, experience happening to me, uh, I think if it hadn't been for Dr. Sprinkle, I probably would have been in the institution by now. Carl's is not the only abduction case. There are others who claim to have been UFO captives. The giant mills outside of Salt Lake City are the center of steel production in the West. My name is Pat Roach and I work at the steel company in Orem. I'm a millwright apprentice. I should be a journeyman another year or two. Pat is one of 5,000 employees at the steelworks. When she completes her training as a millwright apprentice, she will be the only woman licensed to make repairs on the heavy machinery. When the work whistle blows, Pat hurries home to her number one responsibility. She is the sole support of five young children. On October 16th, 1973, the normal flow of her life was dramatically altered. Pat recreates the events for In Search Of. It was about 8 o'clock in the evening. My little boy was four at the time. He climbed up beside me and he had his blanket with him and we fell asleep. Sometime between eight and midnight, something invaded the privacy of Pat's home. Her children, normally alert to strange sounds in the night, slept on, as if put in a deep trance. 
they would later believe that they were abducted during their sleep. child reported seeing something too strange to believe. Police Sergeant Ray Edwards answered Pat's call for help. He investigated the area but could find no evidence of an attempted break-in. The following morning, Edwards filed an official report, leaving the case open. He dismissed the claim of Pat's six-year-old Deborah, who insisted the house had been invaded by spacemen. Nevertheless, for the Roach family, an unsettling mystery still hung over their household and was to persist for the next two years. UFO investigators believe victims suppress the memory of an abduction because they are programmed to do so. Researchers feel, however, that children stand a better chance than adults of resisting mind manipulation. I wouldn't have actually known what happened that night. I probably wouldn't have even investigated it at all if it hadn't been for the fact that two of my children were just positive that they were spacemen. I began reading about UFOs and I began looking at magazines that had stories about UFOs and seeing other people's experiences and I thought there must be more to it than what we know and so I thought well the only way we'll find out any more is to go under hypnotism. Tell me more about the time. In order to recall the events Pat contacted Dr. Jim Harder of APRO the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization and I and two other members of APRO are in charge of the close encounter investigations. What I mean by that essentially are close encounters in which people have had uh, intimate contact with uh, what could only be called alien beings. I have talked with 30 or 40 people who've had such experiences. Now in various degrees I've been able to regress them through um, particular experiences. One, zero. Your whole body's feeling very heavy and relaxed, except that your left arm is beginning to feel The hypnosis enabled Pat to retrieve memories that she had long buried. I remember what the interior of the spaceship looked like. It seemed that the walls fell away as you went to the ceiling and you could see the stars and everything. There was a TV scanner that would start at the top of my head and go all the way down and come back again. It was like an eye. I was examined by a man that was just an ordinary man. He was a little over six foot tall. So I was very upset because he came at me with a needle, a long needle right here. I was angry with them because I didn't feel that they had any right to come into someone's home and take them. And what I was particularly upset with them about was that um, I didn't know where my children were. They know everything about us physically, how to make us well and 
everything about how our body operates, but they can't understand our um, emotions and our feelings and our idea ideas about things. They don't understand us. I don't believe that um, they really want me to go on TV and um, tell my story because uh, if it's happened to other people, they might start putting the pieces together and realize that they've had the same experience. Powerful radio telescopes point to the heavens, listening to the noise of the universe. Astronomers committed to the concept that it is impossible for extraterrestrial life to come to Earth believe that if contact is made, it will come through a radio signal across the infinite expanse of space. But there are others, ordinary men and women, who insist that intimate contact has already been made. Coming up next, In Search Of continues with a probe into time travel. Then 20th Century with Mike Wallace reports on the scrutiny of the police in the wake of the Rodney King and Amadou Diallo incidents. And later tonight, The Men Who Killed Kennedy takes a close look at the evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald may not have acted alone at 9 here on the History Channel, where the past comes alive. Thank you.